is told that at the second or third festival, either 71 or 72, uh, Ralph either presented Bill Monroe in a bluegrass band or a blues performer. I, I don't know which. I've heard the story both ways. An authentic, maybe Muddy Waters or, or Skip James Sunhouse, an authentic blues performer. And uh, a num the uh, number of aides who worked on Capitol Hill in the House office building, buildings and the Senate office buildings would come down the hill, eat their lunch on the mall, and listen to the music and watch the crafts and so on. There was a guy at that uh, who came, who, who moseyed on down, um, uh, who, who really was taken by the, uh, the festival and the whole, the whole project. Um, he was a guy who worked for, uh, 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 Sen I, think, I think at the time, Senator Ralph Yarborough, a guy named Jim Hightower. Same Jim Hightower, the, commentator. the co progressive, uh, irreverent, uh, funny, in-your-face commentator. Uh, Jim was working for the senator then, and Jim apparently walked down to the mall. He didn't know any of us, and he heard Bill Monroe, and he, oh, he was just in seventh heaven. He went up to see Ralph, and... Uh, he said, uh, he introduced himself and, you know, Ralph didn't know much about Yarborough or politics and what can I do for you? And uh, 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 Jim said, well, what do you want done? <laughs> it was, uh, I wasn't there, but the way it both told it to me, it was a very funny encounter. And uh, finally, Ralph said to Jim, what do you do? Well, we pass laws. <laughs> and uh, Ralph said, I, what has that got to do with me? And then Jim said, well, we can pass a law that will benefit the folk festival. Oh, and Ralph was very excited. He said, well, I don't know much about politics, but I have a friend at, in Illinois who knows a lot about politics. Why don't I get him down here next week and uh, he'll have him meet with you? Ralph invited me down in a weekend or so, and I met Jim. Jim was living on Capitol Hill then, and uh, uh, we began pl planning for legislation. We figured out what to do, but Jim wrote the bill. You know, it, to put it in in. Uh, a legal language, technical right. language. Well, it was uh, Ralph. Ralph was. I think Ralph would be responsible for the administrative details, how it was to be handled in the Smithsonian. I was responsible for the conceptual background, why we were doing it, what we were doing, it, why we were, co why the government should commit itself to diverse folk culture. So my message was from the get-go, pluralism, that we had many folk cultures, not one, not bluegrass, not blues, not klezmer, not Cajun, all of them. Yarborough was head of the committee. It was a, a, on education and labor or museums and, and very popular. And the Democrats were in a majority. And we were asking for such a small sum of money, I think a million dollars, that it, it was supposed to be routine. You know, uh, you'd have the public testimony that would say the bill was a good bill and then the committee would recommend it unanim unanimously, and they would find some way to slip it through on an off day. That was the plan. And here Ripley test was the first to testify, and we, we had a oh about fifteen other people. I testified, and uh, Roger Abrams, and we had Ladona Harris, the wife of Senator Harris, who was an American Indian, and we had a black blues performer, I think the Reverend Kirkpatrick. The names are in the congressional record. But, you know, we were all lined up to speak. But Dorson, uh, 
had to point out, or Ripley pointed out, that although Ripley liked the festival, it was his duty to explain that his board of regents or the governors of the Smithsonian had voted against the bill, and uh, he, he, he therefore couldn't support the legislation. And Yarborough, I, I was sitting down in the front row looking up and Yarborough turned red, white, blue, green, purple. He was so angry that it was unscripted, un, you know. It, it, see, when you, when you, in the Senate, the sponsor of the bill, the main party, supports it, and if there is opposition, it comes from the Republicans. But here, the principle in the, Yarbrough's conception was, we are doing this as a favor to the Smithsonian. We're adding to your responsibility. We're adding to your prestige. We're adding to your budget. And then Ripley gets up and says, well, Senator, thanks, but no thanks. Ripley did not want to have the idea of a national foundation that would then give out grants and money. Ripley didn't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, there was issues about um, regents control, which is the kind of governance body of the Smithsonian that oversees that. Uh, their involvement. Uh, there were, quite frankly, a lot of jockeying going on uh, within the Smithsonian over control and what monies would come with this, and uh, it, it, it got very involved. In and I have to say, I mean, Ralph himself was um, ambivalent at best about kind of bureaucratic and organizational <laughs> structures. So uh, it wasn't where Ralph did best. <laughs> So the hearing was effective. We went through the motions. You know, uh, 15 of us spoke for the bill. Uh, uh, Dorsen spoke and Ripley, two against. You know, by any sc score of competitive sports, we would have creamed the opposition, but they creamed us. Eventually, that legislation got uh, went through a second uh, uh, a second reincarnation. Archie Green got involved in a big way. Jim asked me, or I asked him, what are we going to do with the bill? There was no bill. And he said, well, I'll turn it over to you if, if you want it. And I did. I was out of work. I didn't have anything to do. I said, okay. Who will we get as a sponsor? The Republican rise to power had started, and Senator Tower beat Yarborough. Well, we have to get a Democrat, but we want to get one at the beginning of this term, so we'll have six years to go, we don't want our guy to be defeated. Senator Aberesk, Hubert Humphrey got involved, William Fulbright got involved in 1970 and was the lead sponsor on the legislation for this. Um, there was a folk hearing that um, Fred Harris, LaDonna Harris's husband, held on the mall in uh, seven, 1970, I think, 1971 or two, something like that. Uh, basically for this, this kind of legislation that would create some type of national entity that would deal with folk life. And, you know, we introduced the bill, but the problem was where to house this folk center. We could, the Smithsonian was out. The endowments were unfriendly, so we set it in the Library of Congress because the library had had an archive of folk song for 20, since 1928. It was the same bill with a change of name from American Folklife Foundation Act, the setting up of a third cultural arm to American Folklife Preservation Act. Just, we were going to preserve folklore. So it took the stress away from a structure to a process and the structure was left ambiguous. That is, we would basically work in the library under library norms. 
And also we deleted grant making so that we would not incur the enem enmity of Nancy Hanks and the NEH. So we would be strictly, up, we would have outreach work, we could fund outreach work, but not give grants. And uh, one other change, uh, the preamble uh, that had been written originally, I think Ralph, Ralph and his friend Roger Abrams wrote a very technical, highfalutin, politically correct statement, and I simplified it. So the present, uh, present much quoted uh, preamble is mine. At the last minute, uh, Archie Green uh, revised the definition of folk life that's found in the legislation, and he called up uh, the staff aide to uh, Senator Pell at the last minute, and he says, we've got to make a change in the definition. And uh, the aide later grumbled to me, uh, his name was Ray Nelson. He said, he said, I thought he would be calling up about money or something, but instead he just wants to change the definition. Well, as it happens, that revised definition has now been used by state government, by some foreign governments and in, in legislation in other countries. It's been, in fact, a model and influential definition of our field and of the domain that it covers uh, that served us well ever since. And so I, at least, am grateful to Archie for fighting at the last minute to fix the definition uh, and to make one that we can all be proud of uh, as representing our field. I didn't want to waste any time. Uh, time was of the essence. As it turned out, it took about six, eight, I think it took eight years, four, four sessions. I never thought I'd be a lobbyist and didn't know what a lobbyist did. I knew that they were well paid and wore good suits and took people to lunch and dinner and left big checks and made campaign contributions. Obviously, I couldn't do that. Uh, no, I didn't dress up. I don't think I ever wore a tie in all of those years. I don't think I ever wore a tie after I quit teaching. And uh, I didn't have any fancy leather briefcase. I carried around a plastic, you know, department store bag. I, with a bill and I was very informal and I expected the congressman to take me to lunch. What you usually do, you don't ever see a congressman first, you see an aide. You know, you walk into the office, characteristically, the receptionist is usually a good looking girl. That That's a, it's sexist, but that's a tradition of Congress. She gets a thousand people a day wanting to see the congressman, so she has to turn them off politely. That's her function. Who do you represent? Well, I used to teach school, or I represent the shipwrights. I don't represent anyone. And uh, what's a bill about? Well, you know, like the festival on the mall, or... Uh, bluegrass music or Indian tribal dances or quilts or fiddles or duck decoys or... <laughs> and, you know, I try to find something so that I would get into their consciousness in a minute. Now, I'll tell you the best story and the quickest response. I went into one office, I even forgot the state now, and... Uh, explain my bill in about a minute and then she said oh sit down you know wait and in the meantime there were you know about there's always about 10 people waiting and you could tell a lobbyist they have italian silk suits well dressed they're all they're not suntanned you know they're all oh you know uh they've been to too many smoke-filled rooms, too many cocktail parties. Their faces are kind of fat, and uh, uh, they have makeup, sort of makeup, 
or tonic, you know, and they pay, wait, pay, they have big, attractive leather briefcases embossed, you know, with their names, and they're waiting, 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 so they can. She, oh, these guys are waiting, and I'm, I'm there. I'm dressed about like I am now, and uh, then a man comes through the main door, and he's turned, nods to the receptionist, and is going into his office along the side. And I don't recognize him, but that's her boss, that's a congressman. And she, she calls me, Arch, Mr. Green, he's here. So I jump up and stand in the doorway. I keep the congressman going into his office, and I say, I'd like you to get on the bill. I do about a 30-second spiel, and I say, yeah, your, your secretary, she knows all about it. And the congressman, he looks at her and she winks or something, and then he says, yeah, I'm okay, and then he kicks me out, and I go down the hall to the next office. You know, that transaction was the shortest transaction ever. So I'm down the hall, uh, I don't know how many feet, and I hear someone call my name. And I turn around and I, I don't recognize anyone, so I keep going. And then the, this guy said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I look back, it's one of these lobbyists. And he comes up to me and introduces himself and he hands me his card. Now, when you get a card, you, you don't look at it on the protocol, you feel it with your thumb. Because if, it, you know, if it's embossed, you know what, yeah. in printing, that means it's classy. He has money. Well, this guy has given me an embossed, an ordinarily printed card on a lithograph is just flat, so your finger won't show anything. But if there's a recession, if the letters are incised, he, that means he has money. Well, he was for the American Petroleum Institute. And he said, I'll be honest with you, I've been waiting to see that congressman for a month. And you are in this goddamn office for two minutes and you get him to sign up your bill. He said, you're, you're the best lobbyist in Washington. He says, how much are you getting paid? I said, no, I'm a volunteer. And he was flabbergasted if it to be tied. He said, give us a ring anytime you want to come to work for the American Petroleum Institute, you have a job, double your present salary. And I said, uh, I don't believe in what you're lobbying for. I, I'm against the, you know, drilling in Alaska. I'm for conservation. And he laughed. He said, oh, that's all. I don't care what you believe in. We want you.